All right, well, last week we looked at the summary of the pruning of the vine. And we saw this chapter, it was critical that we recognize that God is the vine dresser and that Jesus is the vine and you and I are the branches and that God needs to prune us. And it doesn't always feel good, but it always is good. Amen? Amen. And that's it. We need that. We need that clipping because if not, our natural tendency is to go into the mud as we saw. And so God comes for our good and begins to prune us. But let's pick up where we left off in these last three verses. Join me at verse 9 if you would. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. And abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, last week when we look at this verse, I I emphasized the word abide. We looked at the critical necessity for abiding. Would you look at me for a second, please? Very important that we understand that we have to be abiding, rooted and planted. Abiding is something that is stationary, not something that's floating through. And we discussed briefly that we have such a problem, such an anemic Christianity, because instead of abiding, if here is the fount where his blessing and his word and his will comes out, we go Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and then we do Devos, you know, in the morning, and, and so when we, and this is what we do. Conference, okay, boom, back, forth. And this is what we're doing, and so this is what we look like to the world because we ourselves have not found ourselves rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. And so we're tossed to and fro because instead of abiding, we're visiting. And I'm trying to share with all of us that we're never going to grow and be healthy as visiting, but we need to be abiding Christians. Amen. And that's what his challenge was to us. Now, we talked about a couple misconceptions about abiding. Notice the first one I taught last week is it's not based on feelings. People in this very room can say, hey, no, me and God, we're like this. But are you? At the same time, there's some of us in this room that might just say, hey, you know what? I just feel like God is so far from me. I just feel like God can never love me. The things that I've done, listen, the word of God is true. And we learned last week that it, last week that it doesn't say that the feeling will set you free, but... The truth is what sets us free. And so right now, you may feel that God can't love you, but I'm going to tell you today in this sermon, God does love you. And so it's not based on our feelings. And the second part, when we might think that we're all good with God, well, then you need to know the second misconception. And the misconception is that you can abide with God without obeying. That's not true. You see, if you are not obeying God's word, then you are calling yourself God. And there can't be two. You see, you're either listening this morning to the word of the Lord or the word of self. And so that is where we were recognizing that, hey, it's critical that we understand abiding because if I'm just doing what I want, where I want, just say, hey, I feel it's okay. I feel I can do this. I know you guys say this, but it just doesn't feel right with me. Then you are the Lord of your life rather than Jesus Christ. It's not his name. It's his job description. And so that is what we saw. But I want you to recognize these two verses for me now because I want you to see something even more critical. Last week I only emphasized the abide. I want you to see a word that is used even more than abiding in this word, and that is the word love. Look at verse 9 with me, as you, as you, if you would, please. Just as the Father has what? Loved me, I have also loved you. Stop right there. Look at this way, please. He is saying, just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. The way in which the, the God of the universe, the maker of the universe, has poured himself onto me, that is the very thing that flows out of me onto you. And so his own words say, just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. And then it says, abide what? In my love, now underline that, circle that, abide in my love, not in my law, but in my love. That is so critical. If you can catch this part of, this, of the message this morning, I guarantee you, every person in this room, your life will be changed. I guarantee you. Can you imagine what your week would have been like last week if you thoroughly abide in his love, if you abode in his love? If you would have completely recognized that you were fearfully and wonderfully made by the God of the universe who loves you just because. You see, we would not need all the things around us that draw us in such insecurity. If we would understand how loved we are by God, then we would care less what this world thinks of us because we're caring more what we think of this world. Amen. That's the difference. You see, 
Most of you know my story, and I don't have the time to tell you the whole story, but just in reminding you, it wasn't exactly easy growing up blonde hair and blue eyes in Papakolea. I make the joke, but I'm pretty serious. I was pretty much in third grade before I realized my first name wasn't Effin and my last name wasn't Howley. Because that's pretty much all I was called. And even at times on the field, and even sometimes teachers, not, you know, on Okhalele, shame on you. But there was times when I was even just, so I was being told I was a Howley blank, and this and that, and all this kinds of stuff. But you know how I survived? How I didn't have to go through choke hours of therapy or get stoned or drunk or go after all the other things that people say, oh, because I was treated this way, I went into all these other perversions. No, I'll tell you how that didn't happen in my life because my mom understood this verse. And every single day as I tried to sneak out of the house to go to school, she would grab me, pull me back, plan a big old fat wet one on me, <laughs> and say, your father loves you. I love you, God loves you, and you're handsome. <laughs> and I'd go to school, and they'd be all, blah, 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 effing holy. i go, but I'm handsome. Because <laughs> it didn't matter what they were saying. Where my foundation was, I was loved. I knew my papa God loved me, and I knew my earthly papa and mama loved me. And you see, it's critical that we understand, hey, as the father loved me, I love you. So stay there. Abide in it. Fill up on my love. Fill it to the fullness so that it pours out and flows out of you. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You see, the commandments are not this law for the sake of law. No, it's guidelines. It's structures to keep us in the love affair. And when we say, ah, I don't need that, then we find ourselves completely, again, weak. Listen. Loneliness is the malnutrition of the soul that comes from feeding on substitutes. Yes. And when you're out there of all this stuff and trying to find this, trying to, some of you are even married today and you're lonely. And I'm telling you, it's the malnutrition of the soul, not companionship. And you see, are you abiding in the love of the Father that the God of the universe came, lived, and died for you? That's the connection that we have to understand. He says that to us clearly. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now notice what by abiding in his love, not just his law, notice what happens. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you. Why did he tell me all this? So that my what? My joy would be made in you, and that your joy would be made, how kind? Full. Full. Would you describe yourself, would others describe you as joyful? That's the question. You see, joyful people are those who are filled with the love of the Father, because there is no greater love than the love that comes from the Father. And that's where it's not in all the toys. It's not in all the activities. No, 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 no. It's in the presence and the power and the love of God. Amen. And that's what he's teaching. And that's what he's showing so that you and I would see this. Now, what a promise. What a promise, he says. Well, actually, you do this, your joy will be full. Now, somebody taught me years ago, and I believe it with all my heart, and they said this. Joy is equal to God's presence, not happiness. Yeah. If you've never written that down, I'm going to encourage you to write that down. Joy is equal to God's presence, not happiness. I can be honest and tell you in this room, there have been times that I haven't been ha-ha happy, but I've had joy. Where I've known his presence with me, and I know his purpose is at work. Why is that critical? Well, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so when I know that he is with me, that is what directs joy in my life, and that is where I find the strength to endure and go through the painful circumstances, whatever they may be. Now, he shares with us the critical necessity for being abiding, being rooted and planted, then allowing ourselves to be pruned so that there would be the maximum potential for fruit. And then he brings us on now to the saying, and as that fruit is there, what do you need? You need those nutrients that grow up from the roots. And what are those nutrients? It's love. 
And so now that he's taught us where, how, and what, now he's telling us next what this looks like in our lives. And so if you're taking notes, I want you to recognize and jot down that this is our relationship with each other. We're going to look at this morning our relationship with each other and our relationship with our world. The first part of this sermon is our relationship with each other. Look at verse 12. Jesus says this, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. Now, this is a verse that's probably not new to most of you uh, if you've been in Christianity for any period of time. But let's pay attention to what's truly and honestly and deeply being said. First of all, Jesus says, this is, what's the next word? My. Would you circle the word my? Why is that important for you to know that? Who's the one that's supposed to give the commandments? God, you see, Jesus here isn't saying, this is the Father's, this and see, as a pastor, you'll never hear Waxer saying, and this is my commandment. No, I am teaching, thus saith the Lord. But Jesus here is saying, this is my commandments. These who are listening, these Jews know that the God of the universe is the one who gave the Ten Commandments. He's the one who gives the commandments. So if Jesus is standing in front of them saying, this is my commandment, Jesus is saying, once again, he is? Oh, you smart that. <laughs> it's important to know that. These are God's commandments. Because Jesus is God, and number two, you need to understand that this isn't just some doctrine of a church. This isn't just something that we teach. This is part of the critical mass of who we are. As I told you, you were either this morning rooted and grounded, and how are we rooted and grounded? By obeying his word. That's where, if I'm just uprooting myself and going where I want to, so it's critical we get that he says, this is my, and then the next word after that is? commandment. It doesn't say suggestion. It doesn't say, hey, this is my idea. This is my theory. Would you please know, Christian, it says this is my what? Commandment. Very, very important that we get that because, again, as it says in this text, it said in chapter 14, it will say two more times in our passage this morning, and that is this, if we love him, we keep what? His commandments. Now, what does verse 13, 12 and 13 tell me? It tells me very critically that I am to love as he has loved. Notice what it says here. This is my commandment that you love. What's it say? Okay, would you circle that? This is my commandment that you love one another. My point, the God of the universe has told you and I this morning that we are to love not just God, but we are to love what? Each other. And how are we to love each other? Okay, not half kind, not small kind. We are to love as he has loved us. Now, come on, let's be honest. That's where it kind of gets hard sometimes, doesn't it? Uh Uh-huh. We are to love as God has loved us. Now, how did God love us? Well, we're going to look at that here this morning, but he's going to show us in just a moment that he laid down his life. You see, I am told this morning that if I am a new creature in Christ, the byproduct in me is going to be love. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. It's something miraculous and something amazing that when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ and you are connected to the soil, to the root, the nutrients of love will come into your life and you will find it miraculously there to go out of your life. I'm just telling you straight up, that's how it is. Listen, I hear people say all the time, oh, I love God, but I just don't love Christians. Or I just don't love the church. Or I don't love people, so on and so forth. But I love God. I'm going to tell you right now, sorry, no can do. No can do. If you are born again this morning, you will have the love of the Father in you to love one another. That's his words, not mine. And I'll tell you what, when you love someone, you start loving the things they love. I'm serious. Do you think I really liked doilies 25 years ago? picket fences and all these things that my house is all. I didn't know what a valance was 25 years ago. Now I install them all over the house because I love her and thus I've learned to love what she loves. Shabby chic. And I will walk through a store and go, hey, babe, look, isn't that, oh, good eye. (laughs) 
I trained. <laughs> the sign on the door is what? One, not one like, one love. And the Lord has called me to love as he has loved me. But I'm going to tell you something. It's not really that hard as a Christian to love. And so if you're really struggling with it this morning, I need to challenge you. I need to rock your world a little bit because I have found this as a Christian. It's easier for me to love people than it is to like them. That was amazing. There's a lot of amens in here. Shall we close in prayer? No. There are people whom I have a love for, but I don't necessarily want to do lunch. (laughs) Because God gives me that love. They may be so completely different and distinct from me in style and manner and mannerisms, that doesn't matter. They are my family. And I got sad news for you. If God is your father, I am your brother. Deal with it. (laughs) All right. That's who we are. You see... We need to love as he loved us. See, here's the secret. How do I live this kind of love? It's right there in the verse. Circle the word just as. Just as. You see, how do I live in a love that's from above? I learn that it is just as. You see, just as he got it from the Father and gave it to us, I am to get it from the Father and give it to others. This love that I have for the world and those around me is not manifested. It's not by me trying harder. It's not my, me by knowing I'm supposed to. It's if I first go to the fount, get filled with his love, nothing but love is the extent of what can flow out of us. Amen? That's the secret. It's right there for us. Now, he tells us how he's about to love us. He says, hey, this is my commandment, love one another. Now, let me show you, just as I did, let me show you what I did, and this is what Jesus did. He says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. This is how much you are loved. Eyes this way. You are loved this much. I don't care what your mother father, grandfather, coach, whomever it was, teachers said whatever they said to you, you are loved that much. That the God of the universe who fearfully and wonderfully spoke this earth into existence, spoke you into existence, became a human, lived amongst us so that he could take your place and mine on the cross. And the Bible tells me, it tells us that you and I are loved this much. If you are loved this much, then how can we be so rocked by what somebody at work said about us? Why would we spend so much money and time and energy on clothing and chasing all these things, fads, whatever they be, and trying to get accolades if we could only remember we are loved this much? But here's the next part. According to the verse that I just read, he says, love just as I love you. And if I am loved this much, I am to love you this much. This is how we are called to love. This is how, hear me now, we are equipped to love. God is not going to give us a commandment without giving us what? The enablement, giving us the power to do it. Let me prove it to you. Let me show you something. The scripture says in here, it says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his what? Okay, circle that word life. Because those of you in here who've had a basic Greek, understanding that the word life is normally what Greek word? Zoe. And so when you hear the word life, that which is breath, that which is living, it's the word zoe. That's not the word that Jesus chooses to use here. He uses the word suke, where we get our word psyche, where we get our word spirit or soul. Do you understand what God just said? He chose his word specifically that you and I would know. He's saying, Waxer, I'm asking you to lay down your life, not your breath, my friend, but your life. You see, it might be easier for some of us here this morning to die for one another than it is to live for them. You see, what he is asking us to do is to sacrificially, not just live, but to live sacrificially, not just to die, excuse me, but to live sacrificially for others. That's the love that God is calling us to. 
Can you imagine what our world would look like, what our church would look like, what the church of Jesus Christ would look like, what schools and cities and communities would look like if we thoroughly understood that we are loved this much and I am thus in ca- I am capable and made available to love this much to others. You see, what would it look like if our world thoroughly embraced what God has made available for us? I have something that I love. This entire sermon, this first half completely could be summed up in this simple sticker. Others. See, greater love has no one than this, that they would lay down their life for their friend. Spelled O-T-H-E-R-S. Others. You see, when Gail Irwin came and shared that message with us, he had a bunch of these stickers, and they are without a doubt my favorite. And I have them stamped on my office in different places and things that I would recognize that my life is not my own. It's been bought with a price, and I have the privilege to love and be about others. It's amazing. I don't see this bumper sticker on cars. I don't see this as the mantra of our world. In fact, I see the T-shirts that say it's all about me. me. What would happen if we thoroughly began to understand and believe what Jesus says is, hey, as the Father loved me, I've loved you. And just as getting the love from the Father, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. And so as I got it from the Father, you can get it from the Father and love others. And this is what that love is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be saying, I'm going to lay down my plans, my agenda, my want, my toys, my purposes for the weekend. And I'm going to say, how can I bless you? When's the last time you literally purposefully sought how to bless the neighbor who lives to the left, to the right, or across the street? And said, I want to just love on them. I'm going to make something and bring it over. I'm going to do something special for others because greater love is knowing this and they lay down their life for their friends. Folks, an entire nation was changed. Scotland was changed when one minister had a heart that prayed, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. And most people know John Knox and they know that his prayer was, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. But what most people don't know is how the Lord answered that prayer and he put it in a journal and the Lord said, great, first die and then I'll give you Scotland. And you see, there's some of us here this morning saying, Lord, if I don't get this relationship, I'll just die. Lord, if you just don't help me with my finances, I'll just die. Lord, if I don't get this job, I'll just die. And I'm just going to tell you right now, the Lord is saying, no, 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 die first and then I can give you. It's about first letting God love you. And you and I saying, Lord, I am going to die to self that I might be used to love as I have been loved. Now, I'm going to give you a real practical example about this. And I want your heart with me for the next 10 minutes or so. Because it is easy for us to hear this in theory and to say, amen, and to shout, But you know, several weeks ago, John taught on tithing here. And it was great to hear so many wonderful responses from you. And I spoke about that the week ago after that, that, you know, it's funny how that seems to be the taboo subject. And everyone's like, oh, they're talking about money and so on and so forth. And as you know, uh, it is something that I, unless it's in the text, I don't bring it up in the context that's there because I've seen so many people pervert and tweak it. And I've also seen that it was a thing that caused people from stumbling. But I also mentioned, why is it that it's such a sensitive issue? Well, it seems to be something that seems to be one of our demigods or it wouldn't be so important to us. And so we recognized that and we saw that. Now, I have to share with you in the subject of tithing that you have been amazing as a church. I say this to you, and that is that I know many of my buddies that I pray with and the other pastors, that many of their churches during this recession found complete uh, declines in their giving. Never once did we see a decline in the giving here at One Love. And you know, as I've said before, this is a church that's not filled with many of the wealthy. Most of us in here are in the working class. And and so to see that you have been faithful in what you've been giving, I say hallelujah and praise God. Because you've recognized that tithing is not how much of my money I give to God, but how much of God's money I keep. And so as John taught you, it's our act of worship. It's our act of obedience. Because he's the one that says, take this step of faith. 
And again, are we rooted and planted or are we doing what we feel we want to do? Well, I just feel that's Old Testament. I just feel that when I, what is it that we're doing? And so are we walking in accord and obedience to that? Well, with that in mind, we believe that as a church who wants to walk in obedience, we believe that God has called us to seek and save the lost. Are you with me? And so for that reason, we do many of the things that we do, not just from the pulpit, but our midweek things, what we're doing out on the streets, all the things because we believe that God cares about the lost, and so should we. Second thing we do is we're about discipling the believers. We are here to grow up and mature one another. People are a lot like fish. If you catch them, you got to do what? Clean Clean them. If not, they stinketh. (laughs) And there's a lot of stinky Christians, and people point their finger, but in reality, the responsibility is one another. And so we need to be able to disciple one another. But the third thing God has asked us to be about, and that is comfort the hurting. And he's called us to do that as a body of Christ. And so with that in mind, in 2011, we had a motto that was give them. 2011, we're going to give them. All right. And then in 2012, off the shelf in 2012. And we've got testimonies that are going to blow your mind. So many amazing things that we just can't wait to tell you. It's just trying to find all the time to get all this in for the sermons. But there are so many of you that have been taking this call and got off the shelf. And God is doing amazing things in heaven through. And I can't wait for you to hear that. But i got to share with you as a church as a whole, taking this belief, you have made, we have made some huge investments in reaching to the kingdom. One of those is Kahlo. Most of you here don't know the story because most of you weren't around at that time. The church was about 200 people at the time. But we were asked to be put on this Christian station, Kahlo. And so we went on the station. We saw the fruit of it. And then the owner came to me a little after a year later and said, hey, I'm needing to sell the station. And the person who's going to buy it is not going to be for Christian programming. I strongly encourage that you buy it because it's the only locally owned, operated, Christian operated station. And so I talked to a bunch of other pastor buddies of mine. They're like, yeah, this is great. We're behind you. We're with this and this whole thing. And so they said, you take the point out. And I felt strongly about it. And so I got on a plane. We all prayed as a church. We got on our knees in this room. And, we, and I went to uh, California and was granted a loan by a miracle of God and came back. And we put that seed investment in there in purchasing this station. Now, when we first purchased the station, there was 40,000 people watching it a night. We now got the most recent uh, statistics, 70,000 people. Hallelujah. Amen. This station is in the homes of who knows whom, who wouldn't darken the doors of a church, but are taking a chance to watch and learn about God's love for them and his purposes and encouraging children and so on and so forth. But for some reason, and I don't have the answer, the people of Hawaii have not responded to this station as our investment. At last that I checked, there was 132 people out of 70,000 who support Kahlo. 60 to 65 of those 132 are right in this room. We're doing some things. We've asked. We're, We're going to plan a few other things. But what that means is that this little church has been footing a bill to make sure that the people of Hawaii can have clear, solid teaching, a station where the word is heard. Now, if the scripture then says to me, a greater love has no one than this, and they would lay down their life for their friends, is that what God is asking for us to do as a church as we do this as individuals? Now notice what he says in verse 14. He goes on to say this. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now, what I want you to see right here off the bat is that Jesus is not on some power trip. You see, so often people hear this scripture and they take it out of context. God is about personal, relational building. What he wants is you and I to have a sweet kononia with him. Isn't that amazing? The God who said, let there be, wants you. Now let that register for a moment. You see, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But no longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you what? Friends. Now, I don't know if you've absorbed that or not yet, or you've, you've not been blown away by that, but if you were to hear that God calls you friend, that should give you right now Jesus bumps. Amen. Not chicken skin, they'll give the chicken credit. <laughs> but we ought to be able to say, whoa, God, who made everything, 
not only knows my name, he calls me friend. See, the song that we sang this morning, the writer got it. Look overhead. He starts out, who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Lord, you're the God of the universe, and that you know me and you listen to my heart? Is it true that you're thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. Why? Because he calls me friend. He calls us friend, beloved. And then he goes on to say, God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. That is amazing. He is not some righteous judge, some cosmic cop. He is the God of the universe, the Papa God. You're a father, Adob, who wants to come and say, here, come, let's be friends. It gets even deeper than that. You see, we have to understand what God's heart is for us. So the question that you and I need to ask then is, okay, if God calls me friend, what kind of friend have I been to him? Now let's think about that. We have been called to love as he loved us. Amen? Okay, I want you to honestly raise your hand in this room, knowing that God loves you. You know that God loves you, right? You know that God has loved you. How many of you have in some way have um, betrayed him, uh, hurt him, wronged him in any way? Raise your hand. Okay? Pretty much, yeah, us. Okay, so now, as he has loved us, and yet you know that you have done this unto him, then I'm not going to have you raise your hand on this time. How have we responded to those who have betrayed and wronged us? Talk to the palm, you're not the bomb. (laughs) People have left churches and they've gone to other places because they haven't learned how to love and to abide in his love, to absorb the roots and the nutrients of God's love because then they accuse and they stab one another and they go after all these venomous things because we are not living in the love and given the love that God has made available for every one of his children this morning. This is the rubber meeting the road, church. Are you with me? You see, we need to understand how God's heart is for us, and it is so, so important. I need you to know this. There is something that's really important. Where did I set that down? We need to understand when God's love is for you and for me, what that looks like and what our relationship to him looks like. Here it is. It's entitled Visiting Day. He was looking forward to the moment all day long. After six days of labor, it finally came. Visiting day. The man with the keys opened the large doors and swung them open. The cold gray hall springs to life with the warm glow of light, and he could hardly control his emotions. The families began to arrive. His peers from the corner, he peers from the corner of the room, longing for the first glimpse of his loved ones. He lives for weekends. He lives for the visits. As the cars arrive, he watches intently. Then finally, she arrives, his bride, whom he longs to be with. At one point, they break into singing with interruptions of laughter and applause, but all too soon it's over, and a tear comes to his eye as his bride departs. Then the man with the keys closes the door, and he hears the key turn in the lock, making the end of a special day. There he stands alone again. He knows that with most of his visitors will not be contacting him again till next week. As the last car pulls away from the parking lot, Jesus returns alone and waits until next Sunday, visiting day. Is that how we treat our friend? That we see him and we call him when we need him and we speak, but we do not listen. You see, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. And I want to encourage you to read a little book. It's called My Heart, Christ Home by Dr. Munger. It's super short but it will so bless you. It's about when you give your life to Jesus that as a friend, he comes into your home and he wants to be a part of every room of your house and he wants to know and grow with you. And I would just encourage you to get this book that you would understand it's not a law affair, it's a what? Love affair. He says in verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now let's address this because I've heard people say, oh, what kind of friendship is that? That's, you know, tit for tat kind of thing. No, 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 no. Context plus Content equals meaning. What did he say just before this? Greater love is known than this. They laid down their life for their friends. What has he done for you? He laid down his life for you. So, folks, he's already extended his hand of friendship to you. Amen? 
So it's not if you do something, you get. God has already brought it. So then what does verse 14 mean? He is saying, listen, I have befriended you, but you will befriend me back when you do the same. And then as you love as I have loved you. That's what blesses the Father's heart when you and I love, when we lay down our lives for those who are around us. By heeding God's word, will, and way, that's how I say we are friends. It's not one of those, if we do, then we become. No, it's we do because we are. I've told you that before. I go into the men's room not to become a man. (laughs) I go because I am one. And thank goodness, because I have cleaned the women's bathroom before, and that would be scary if I would then change. All right, now, moving on. Verse 15, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. You see, this goes right over our heads, because we don't live in a caste system, but they did. And in that day, in that period, everyone had a position, and those of the lower positions did not equate or even socialize with those of another system. And that is why the Pharisees would walk around all tantar on because they were of this system and they would and they were disgusted that Jesus would talk and hang out with these people. And what does your God say to us? He says, listen, I don't call you slaves. Others may call you slaves, but you're not a slave. If you are my disciple, you are no longer a slave to Satan, no longer a slave to sin. That is what Jesus is saying. He says, so I'm going to address you, not as servant, not as slave. I'm going to address you as friend. Isn't that awesome? You are friend, Jesus says, and you're welcome at my table. Now, can I have your eyes this way for a sec? Very important. Because again, some of you, you've been told a whole lot of lies. You've been told what your worth and your value was. And I want to tell you right now, you may be thinking, oh, pastor, you don't know what I've done. There's no way this God could love me the way you're talking about it. I'm telling you right now, he knows what you've done, and he's the one that calls you friend. He says, you are not a slave, and you don't have to be a slave to that addiction. You don't have to be a slave to that past and to that burden. Today, you can give your life to Jesus Christ. You can surrender that burden and have him call you beloved. That's his promise, not mine. And it's a powerful one because he keeps his promises. Verse 16, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. Now, we know that verse. We've heard it. Hey, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. But now you see it in the context, how even more beautiful it is, that he's saying, I'm the one that chose you to be friend. God is the initiator of this relationship, and I hope that gets you stoked. But he notices that he's called us to what? To be his friends. Why? That we might be a blessing. I am blessed by him to be a blessing. Just as the Father has blessed me in love, I am to be a blessing to others and love them as he loves us. We are to be in harmony with God. That's why he says, whatever you ask of the Father, in my name, I'll do it. And so as I'm walking in his word, will, and way, God seems to work through my life. Now, but the best part is it doesn't end there. Verse 17, he brings in the key ingredient. You see, he knows the entire thing, like many recipes, will flop if you have all the stuff, but you miss the key ingredient. And so what does he say? Verse 17, this I, what? Oh, there it is again. This I command you, that you love one another. Now, if you think about it, the word love and command really can't go together. It's kind of an oxymoron. You know, love me, love me, love me. You're like, psycho. (laughs) You know, I can't force someone to love. So then how is God saying he's commanding us to love? Well, the Greek word entelemi. And the word that he's using here in entelemi, it literally means the stronger than urge. And so the translators just put it down as command. But it's this charge. I firmly charge you saying this is necessary. It's critical that you plug the holes in the boat before you put it in the water. You can ignore me, but bye bye You're going to get wet. And so Jesus is saying, here's the critical ingredient. Love. You get it, you give it. This is what's going to make it flow. Let me tell you something. Why would Jesus do it this way? Well, there's something about us as human beings that I have found interesting. Does anyone here thoroughly love getting up early in the morning and getting to work on time? Okay, there was one weirdo in the first service, but anyways. I'm like, get a life. No, just kidding. Okay, no. But we don't love getting up early in the morning and getting to work, do we? But we do. Why? 
we are supposed to. Isn't it good that God knows when he gives me things that I'm supposed to, then I just don't try to negotiate, I just do it. Amen. And so he says, wax, this is a non-negotiable. If you're going to be a child of God, you're going to love as you have been loved. You will love one another. Greater love is no one than this, that we lay down our life, our agenda, our wants, our needs, our peculiars for our friends. That is what God says. It's pretty amazing. Now, the thing that I find at the end of the day, then this is the truth, my pride, my sense of justice, all this ultimately will be washed in love. But verse 18 is where this changes our message this morning. Because right now I could just close in prayer and say, wow, just as he's loved, he's loved us. Greater love is no one, and he's loved one, and he's just loving all this. Isn't this great? Let's just bask in the love. Oh. Verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Interesting. (laughs) I want to let you know right now that this verse, I bizarrely find comfort in this verse. It says here, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You see, what this scripture begins to tell me, where I begin to find comfort is this. This planet is not my peeps. This planet is not the people that I'm trying to impress. And so for that reason, I am delivered from understanding that they hated Jesus, and so they're also going to hate me. You see, folks, listen, if I am remotely living like my God, Savior, Master, and Friend, if I am remotely living like Him, then I should be getting what He got, which is adulation and persecution. People came to Jesus and said, you're amazing, you're wonderful, and they wanted to follow Him and go, and there was people that came up to Him and called Him the devil himself. And there was people who sought his death. Christian, I'm wondering this morning, are you of this world? Are you walking in a harmony with Christ? Because if you are living like Jesus, there should be some adulation. People ought to be saying, man, the way you speak to your wife, the way you speak to your husband, the way you speak to your children, the way you children speak to your parent, the way in which you handle yourself at work, there's something about you that's different. That's amazing. Is there any adulation because you're loving like Jesus loves? And at the same time, is there any persecution going on in your life? Because if we are living as he is living and loving as he's called us to love, the Bible says it's going to happen. Now, what does it mean by the world, this world? Well, it's clear and we have to understand that there's three different uses in the Bible. Number one, it talks about the created world, meaning the thing, this cosmos that he made. That's the buildings, the mountains, this kinds of things. The second use of the word world is the word humanity. God so loved the world. He wasn't speaking about the mountain. He's speaking about humanity, that that is what God loves. But the third use, which we see in our scripture today, is the secular system. That which is contrary and opposed to God. All the plans and organizations organizations and activities and philosophies that are without or against God, the values that are opposed to him. That's what he's meaning here, the secular system. And so it says this, if the world, if the secular system, the cosmos hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Now let's get reminded again about that. You see, remember that scene? Powerful scene, and any person with any sense of conscience had a difficult time observing this. But as you see these actors doing a wonderful job in displaying just the cruelty that others can be sitting there with their hands folded and laughing and mocking as a man is being beaten 39 times with a cat. Nine straps of leather with glass and bone inside it. And as we see this scene and Jesus falls down and he gets back up and he holds it again, I saw it and I said, Lord, why? Why did you even get back up? And immediately the Spirit said with me, because... You need to see this is what happens. This is the potential of humanity without love. This is what we're capable of. To laugh, to turn the other eye when Pol Pot is killing people, when a Hitler is destroying people, when genocide is going on and people today are aborting babies. We can just turn our eyes away. Or we can recognize this is what happens when we refuse to love as he has loved us. 
And we need to get this in our mind and to understand this. If the world hates you, know that it hated me. Verse 19, it says this, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world's going to hate you. You see, this morning, are you with and of the world or not? You see, because as a Christian, God's system of being others-minded rather than self-minded, you're going to have times when you're going to go against the flow. We've all seen these kind of stickers. We've seen these kinds of shirts where in a Christian's life, if God is calling me to be others-minded, to heal, to ask for forgiveness, to not demand my rights, there's times when I'm going to butt heads with this world. I'm going to butt heads with people at work because I'm not going to do the deal dirty or whatever it is because I'm going the way Jesus calls me rather than the world. Are you with me? I love this one, but I love this one even better. Isn't that awesome? See that one little guy looking that way? And everyone else is looking this way. Looking how much they can get. And he's looking, how much can I give? Who here needs help? How can I minister to them? And that is my prayer that we would understand that that is what God is calling for you and I today. So how do we live in this world and not be of this world? Well, as a sailor, I can simply explain it to you. When you get a boat, you're supposed to put it in the water. You don't want the water. Now, some of you this morning, you've been asking, how come my life just isn't sailing? How come I feel like I'm sinking? How come I feel like I've just been dredging along? Is it perhaps because you have compromised and compromised? You've been so concerned about the things of the world that you've been inviting it into your life, into your vessel, and you find yourself sinking. Folks, today is the time to start bailing. It's the time to say, Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. And God will do it. He will do it in your life. 1 John 2, 15 says this, Do not love the world, nor the things of this world. For if anyone loves this world, the love of the Father is not in it. Did you hear that? It's one or the other. I'm either caring all about them, or I'm asking, Lord, what is your will? He says this, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. The passions, possessions, positions, the kingdom of kingdom, all of these things, they rob, steal, and kill our joy. And God is saying, oh, if we can just abide in his love, absorb the nutrients of it coming through the root system, and we love as we've been loved, oh, the things that will happen to our lives and those around us. And the world will hate you for it, but you will be blessed in it. Amen? Oh, I hope you understand that. See, it says here that this secular system that some of us are trying so hard to be friends with, in reality, it hates us. And I have to ask, why? Why is the venom so spent out on the Christian lifestyle today as it's getting even more and more prevalent? Remember this guy? All he tried to do was play football. You know, yeah, he's got Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 right underneath here. So that every time the camera zooms in on them, they see, for by grace you've been saved through faith. Amen. And you know, it's just like David Letterman and Jay Leno and all these guys just found it joke after joke, night after night, ripping on this guy and the t bone I mean, is this really that offensive? Does that really bother people? What is so disgusting about a man just saying, hey, to God be the glory, great things he's done? Well, I don't see how that's so offensive. Now, if he took the microphone and said, you all sinners, and you spent your money to be here, you should have been in church on Sunday morning, not a football stadium. Okay, I can understand that. (laughs) But all he did is every time God gave him a gift, he sat down and said, God, you gave me the gift. That pass went where it needs to go. Thank you, Jesus. You see... The world is steaming up more and more and more. It wasn't happening like this in my daddy's day, but it's happening in my day. And when I was a young man, I knew that Jesus told me that I would lead a generation that would go through persecution. I knew it. I knew it then. You've heard me talking about it for a long time in this church. Listen, why is such venom against the Christian? Well, let's be honest. Some of it's been deserved. Some of it's deserved, where we've had double standard, where we've lived contrary to what God's word, will, and way is. We've said one thing and lived and walked another. The hypocrisy of those who have had to leave because of the embezzlement and all the other nonsense, as well as our own lives. And we need to own up to it. But some of it is not. Some of it you have to understand, church, that light in the eyes is painful. And when you turn on the light, people don't like this. And see, as the truth, there is light. And you see, somebody once put it this way. Truth is hate for those who hate truth. 
And so I've been called a hater because all I'm trying to do is speak the truth in love. But you and I have to understand that it's like light in the eyes. And so when they have a negative reaction, they are not my enemy. They are the very persons whom Jesus died for and wants me to love. Amen? Amen. Truth is hate for those who hate the truth. If you can understand that, then you might be a little bit more compassionate in our life as we minister as what Jesus is saying. Last verse, and we're done, says this. Remember the word that I said to you, verse 20. A slave is not greater than his master. Well, actually, you're not, you're not better than me. So if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if they kept my word, they would keep yours also. See, folks, the Bible says that persecution will come to his people. Now, we're not here yet. We've not yet come to the point where we have to stand in an arena and pray over one another as they're picked off one by one by lions. But that's in our pedigree. And these folks stood up for the faith and sang and worshiped God for their very last breath. So much so it's documented, it drove Nero crazy because when he came down to look at their bodies, there were smiles on their dead faces. We're not there yet. Listen, losing tax-exempt status or losing a building, this isn't persecution. It's inconvenience. And I hear people all the time going, But just understand, where are we going to go? Where are we going to take 1,000 people, and where are we going to have 200 children? Where, where, Kapilani Park just doesn't have that much parking. So what is it? Where is it? How is it? And if you think I'm just making too much out of it, good old America, good old Phoenix, man faces jail time for having a Bible study in his home. He's about to get 60 days in jail, fined $12,000 because he has three nights a week Bible studies in his home. He lives in four and a half acres. It's not like he's in an apartment building. But they're saying if you're going to gather to have a Bible study, then they call it a church, and then he needs to have sprinklers in his home. He needs to have exit signs and all the doors, and so they signed him up for 67 violations for leading a home group, and they're putting him in jail. That's where we live. It's time to love, people. Amen? Amen. Let's love them into heaven because that's how I got into heaven. He so loved me that he gave his only son. Let me summarize this message. He loves us. Amen? Amen? And we need to love as he loved us. Jesus loves me sacrificially. How am I sacrificially loving him and loving this world he calls me to live in. And so then we are to ask ourselves, God, do I love others? Do I love the lost more than I love the world? Don't confuse the two. Sometimes we're finding ourselves amongst the world thinking we're out to reach the lost, but who's really influencing who? Be honest. Be clear. Be accountable. See, he tells me in the beginning of this chapter that he is the vine and I need to be rooted and grounded because he is the vine and I am the branches. Well, it's amazing how much this picture looks like this picture. And you see, if I am rooted and grounded in his love, then as he sacrificially loved for me and died on a cross, then God's gonna give me the love to die for my neighbor. Not sue them because they're six inches on my property. All the nonsense that I've heard that is robbing, killing, stealing, and destroying our joy. Amen. This morning, do you need a daddy? You need a friend? You need someone who loves you unconditionally, who's already proved it? It's not talk. He's already laid down his life for you, and he's been calling you every day of your life, and he's brought friends and others around you and brought you even to this place this morning so that you can finally stop striving and trying to earn and trying to be better. No, no, no. Come just right now as you are to Jesus Christ. He loves you that much. He loves you that much that it's not clean up your act and follow him, but it's follow him right now and watch what he wants to do to your act. Surrender and receive the friendship. God will not force himself upon you, but today, if you will humbly ask him, he will become your savior, 
Lord and friend. It's the best friend I've ever had.